What is up, people? Van from the Vanderbilt Gaming Channel here, bringing you another video on Slots Crown of the Magister. Today's video, we are going to cover the Inner Strength DLC that just released. I'm going to go over what is part of the paid DLC, what came free with this DLC, and give you a, a brief taste of what it's like to seduce everybody and Eldritch Blast everybody in the face, and even kick people and stun them on every attack you make. So without further ado, let's get into this review and then just know that in future videos, if you sub and click the little bell, then I will make complete review guides on the Bard, on the Warlock, on the Monk, and even complete reviews of all backgrounds that are now available after the DLC and all feats that are now available after the DLC. So with this DLC, the paid portion that we're going to get for buying, it's like 10 bucks, is going to be the Dragonborn Ancestry, the Warlock class, the Bard class, and the Monk class. That is what we're paying for. Now, each class comes with three subclasses with the Inner Strength. And if you own the Lost Valley DLC, then you can get the fourth subclass, which is only available to people who own the Lost Valley DLC. Now, the free stuff that came with this, regardless if you own Inner Strength DLC or not, is they brought out three new backgrounds, which would be the Aesthetic, the Artist, and the Occultist. Obviously, they came out to partner up with the Monk, the Bard, and the Warlock. And then in addition, they have 17 new feats. Most of the feats are definitely geared towards melee, which we'll cover here in a little bit. And then some of them are a little bit more quality of life things that was necessary in the game, which I'll cover. So we're going to do the overview, and then we're going to get into more details in later videos. So without further ado, let's get started by looking at the Ancestry Dragonborn. All right, so... We have our Dragonborn Ancestry. So with the Dragonborn, what you're going to get, basic movement speed. They have a plus two to strength and a plus one to charisma. So very much so a charisma based is going to be helpful or a strength based. I think these are a perfect fit for a paladin, but you could probably get away with doing maybe a strength bard or doing a warlock. I mean, the warlocks could be a melee warlock, depending on what you pick. Um, but yeah, that's really the three classes I think this would go well with, but 100% a paladin for sure. Could even probably do a Draconic Sorcerer. Uh, with this uh, ancestry, you also get to choose a Dragon type or Draconic ancestry that you want to partner up with. This will give you resistances and damage of a breath weapon based on that. So if I were to say black, I would get a damage resistance to acid and I would get a breath weapon where I spit out acid. So your options are Acid, Lightning, Fire, Poison, and Cold. So you can be thematic about it and say, well, I want to play an evil Dragonborn. Well, then pick Black, Blue, or Green. Or I want to be a good Dragonborn and pick Gold and Silver. Or you can just say, hey, listen, I want to be resistant to fire damage. So let's just pick Gold. And then I want to be able to breathe fire. So that's, that's why we went that way. So a nice addition to the classes, I mean, to the ancestries that are already available. And this just adds a little flavor. I just also like the look of Dragonborns. All right, so now let's get into the different class options that were available. The Bard is where we're going to start. So with the Bard, you are going to get the ability to just charm everyone with your sweet, sweet sound, right? You're going to seduce them all. You're going to pass all of your charisma checks because that's what Bards do. But no, seriously, they get saving throw proficiencies and in intelligence and dexterity. Uh, they can only wear light armor. But the main reason you're going to pick a bard is they have a lot of skills they can choose from and the bardic inspiration. To be able to throw out a 1d6 or a 1d8 a couple times between long rest and eventually short rest can drastically change the outcome of the battlefield, right? You cast that spell that you need to pass and you roll a 1d6 so they make sure they fail their saving throw or whatever it is. So that's really the main reason to have a bard is they are the perfect uh, party support they have heals they got crowd control they can buff your people they're, they're that's just what their job is they're not fun from a oh i do lots of damage or oh i'm a tank no they're just much more this is having a bard in your party makes everybody else better uh they can also cast ritual spells but they have to have the spell um memorized and they get some very unique spell choices now we won't go into the different subclasses in a whole, but we'll click on the Bard Colleges and you can see you have the College of Lore. So this is the basic Bard that comes with the SRD. So if you played 5th edition, you're very familiar with the card College of Lore. This is a really, really strong subclass because of the cutting words where you can actually have people decrease their abilities so you can uninspire them. 
But then at level six, you get the magic secrets early. So you get two spells from any class, including their entire spell list. So this is great because you could be a fireball casting bard or a lightning bolt and pick from the wizard spell class. Or, hey, I want to pick from the druid spell class. Or, so there's just a lot you can do with the College of Lore bard, which is fantastic. Then you have the College of Hope. So this is definitely much more geared towards a healing bard. So if you want to make your bard your main healer, they definitely get a lot of things here with the wandering healer, the healing ballad, and then the words of hope to help with your with your healing both in combat and outside of combat. Then you get College of Heroism. So definitely about picking, making sure that you're doing a good job, bolster morale. You get to actually roll two dice and pick one that's better. You can use your action to kind of bolster immunity against Frightened and Fear. And then you get this one at the bottom where you can do a little bit of thunder damage depending on, you know, how things go with your thundering voice. Then with the Lost Valley DLC, you get the College of Traditions. So you can cast Mage Armor at will. Uh, when you make certain checks, you actually can't roll below a 9 or a 10. Uh... That's basically everything's a 10 or better. And then you get Verbal Onslaught where you can do some things to a couple creatures that will take some psychic damage and also have the potential to stun them. All right. And then as we get to higher levels as a bard, the main thing, Song Arrest, you get to roll extra, extra dice when you're trying to heal up. Uh, jack of all trades, so you can basically make them proficient in a lot of lock picker and traps and all that you get the whole bard expertise you also get bard college this is at level three where you just pick your subclasses um, level five your inspiration goes up to a d8 from a d6 which is fantastic and you regain them on short rest so level five is a huge jump for the bard uh, you get the ability to counter charm and then you at level 10 your inspiration goes to a d10 and then you get your second magical secret so with this normal bard you can get magical secrets once if you pick the college of lore bard you actually can get four spells from other people's uh spell classes so just a great all-around class uh, a lot of people like to play them in tabletop all right so now we'll move on to the monk now the monk is pretty cool a lot of people don't like the monk because of how few key points they get and how many key points they have to use. I feel that they did a really good job with this in Solasta where some of the things that use a key point when you're playing tabletop don't use a key point. You just set them to be active. So a perfect example is when you hit something with your open hand and you knock them back. You no longer have to burn a key point. It's just when you're flurrying, it just automatically does it and they have to save. So there's a lot of cool things they did to make your key points not feel as painful. But still, I've always loved a monk, so let's kind of get into it. Monks have saving throw proficiency with strength and dex. They can use simple weapons and short swords. They have certain skills about history, insights, religion. Um, they're, they can use smith's tools. Their main key of a monk is their unarmored defense. Very similar to a barbarian. They just use their, their dexterity and their wisdom modifiers in order to get their AC. So if you have a high wisdom and a high dexterity, you can pump out a 20 AC uh, without wearing any armor. Uh, in addition, you get martial arts die, which you can automatically use your bonus action to punch something. So you attack with your one attack, punch with your bonus action. So you don't have to be dual wielding to do this. And then your martial arts die will increase in damage as you level up. You get a D6 at level 5 and a D8 at level 11. In addition, you get some cool abilities using your key points. And this is where you can start getting really, really fun with the monk where you can do some things like, you know, do a disengage or do a dash action or do a uh, dodge action, almost like cunning actions that a rogue can do. But then in addition, you can put things like stuns into your attacks or knockdowns. So really versatile with your key points. You just have to be careful because your key points reset on a short rest. So you probably want to pick a party that has a lot of short rest because you're going to be doing it a lot when you have a monk in your party. Now, talk about the subclasses. You get Way of the Open Hand. This is basically like the uh, College of Lorebard. This is the SRD Tabletop 5th Edition version. This is a fantastic subclass. At level three, like I mentioned, you can use your Flurry of Blows. And when you do, you can choose that they get knocked prone, they get pushed back, or they can't take reactions till the end of their next turn. 
So this is just automatically turned on. You select which one you want to happen, and then when you flurry, it automatically happens. So this is fantastic, especially with the not being able to uh, take a reaction. You can always hit them and then run away, or you can knock them back or knock them prone to give everybody else advantage on all their attacks, except for obviously ranged, but all the melees would get advantage. Uh, this level six, a free heal. I mean, come on, three times your monk level, free heal, can't beat it. And then at level 11, when you have you hit by an attack, a single target spell, you can spend one key point to gain spell shield. So super great. And then the next one is going to be Way of Survival. So this one's a much more tanky version. This one has a defensive stance, which you get some more AC when you're doing patient defense. Uh, whenever you take damage from a source, you heal a number of hit points. And then Unmoving Strength, you now add your con modifier to the damage rolls. You're on strike. So... This is really going to be your tanking subclass. And then you get into Way of Light. So this one's a lot more when you hit a creature, you can actually put this Light or Shine spell on them. And then once they're kind of hit with this, you can start hitting them with damage, and it actually starts adding additional damage to them with your Radiant Strikes. And then you get a Blinding Flash where you can do a Light Burst and Blind. So pretty cool idea with the whole Light Fists and all that. Now the one that's part of the Lost Valley DLC is called Way of the Freedom. So Flurry of Blows is improved. When you do Flurry of Blows, you gain advantage on your next attack when you gain this benefit of the dash action until the end of your turn. So pretty cool. And then Swirling Dance, when a creature misses you, you can then use your reaction to immediately attack them. So it basically gives you a opportunity attack without being an opportunity attack, right? I'm hoping, I haven't tried this yet, but it's giving you an opportunity attack without them moving away. So then Flurry of Blows, starting at 11th level, you're going to uh, use your Flurry of Blows. You can make up one additional attack, so you can do three attacks with your Flurry of Blows instead of two. So, I mean, level 6 gives you a free opportunity attack without them moving away. Level 11 gives you an extra punch. I think it's a really great subclass. All right, so now let's get into the leveling up as a monk. So... At level 2 is when you start getting your key points, you, and then your patient defense, step of the wind, flurry of blows. Uh, also, you pick up unarmored movement, similar to the barbarian, where you can move further and go a little bit farther when you, when you run. Um, but these are all really great to have these one key point abilities. Then at level 3, you get deflect missile. So this is where you can catch missiles, and then you can burn a key point and throw it back. So there's nothing cooler than catching an arrow or a crossbow bolt and then throwing it back at them. I mean, you should throw it back. It's a waste of a key point, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, then you get your slow fall at level 4, so you can fall without taking bunches of damage. You get extra attack at level 5, but stunning strike is the main reason to play the monk. Is basically every time you hit something, you can choose to burn a key point and try and stun it. They make a constitution saving throw, which happens often. I mean, a lot of times they're going to save. But if you stun them, then they're screwed. Like, they can't do anything, and they get advantage. They're going to go down. So it's a fantastic ability. And then you get at level 6. Now your basic punches will be magical, so you don't have to worry about having magic armors. At level 7, you get evasion, similar to a rogue. Uh, fantastic ability to have, where you can actually take no damage if you save from, like, a fireball spell. Uh, you become immune to charm and frighten. At level uh, nine, you get unarmored movement, where you, now you can climb, become second nature, so there's no extra movement, so now you just run, climb, whatever. Level 10, you get purity of body, so you're immune to disease and poison. And then at level 12, you choose for another. So you end up getting one, two, you get three actual uh, ability score increases or, or uh, uh, bonus feats, and then you, which is more than most classes. Most classes get two at four, eight, and 12. Um, so, oh, no, 4, 8, and 12. So you get the same as everybody else. All right, so that is the monk. Now let's get into the warlock, and this is probably everybody's main reason for picking up the inner strength. The warlock class is a fan favorite, and what's funny is they don't really do much because they don't have a lot of ability, but what they do, man, are they effective. So the warlock has saving throw proficiencies in wisdom and charisma. They can wear light armor and use simple weapons. Their skills are very much so based on Arcana, Deception, etc. They have Pack Magic, which they can cast from the Warlock spell list. And then they have a Patron, which they can choose to sign up for. So you get your abilities from selling your soul to the devil. 
And depending on which patron, they usually ask a lot of you, and then they bestow powers on you for being their, their bitch, basically. But what's great about the Warlock is they function very differently than all the other Spellcaster classes, which make them a lot of fun. So let's kind of look into the, the, the subclasses. So what's cool about the Warlock, similar to the Sorcerer, similar to the, to the uh, Cleric, they actually get their subclass at level 1. So you have to choose who gave you your power rate right at level 1. So first up, we have the Fiend. This comes straight out of the SRD as well where it gives you the ability to unlock spells that are very fire-based, you know, Burning Hand, Scorching Ray, Fireball, blah, blah, blah. And then you also have the ability to reduce a hostile creature to zero hit points, where you will gain temporary hit points equal to your Charisma Mod plus your Warlock level. So having the ability to gain temporary hit points, if you have a 20 in Charisma and you're level up to level 12, I mean, when you get to level 12, you're going to be getting 60 temp hit points by killing something with this. So this is a pretty powerful spell for you. Um, and this actually works pretty good if you want to be more of a, a melee-based uh, Warlock, but it's such a strong ability. Uh, level 6, you can use an action to bring forth a Fiendish Stroke of Luck, so for the next minute, you roll an additional 1d10 on your ability checks and saving throws. So this is really nice to have, um, to be able to, if you're going to fail something, pass it, and I think this is a nice ability to get. And then you have the Fiendish Resilience once you get a little bit higher. You gain resistance to a certain damage type, and damage from magic or silver weapons ignore this resistance. So you could say, well, I want to re be resistant to bludgeoning damage, or piercing damage, or slashing. So just another way to make you tank here. Now we get to the Hive. The Hive, it lets you, uh, first creature you damage with a spell will have disadvantage on their next saving throw, and it expires in one minute. So this basically softens them up so that you can hit them with a really powerful ability. Uh, you get magic counter, so you can cast the counter spell once per short rest as a feature. So you basically get a free counter spell, which is really nice. Um, and then you also get this reactive carapace, where when you take damage from a spell or magic, you can react immediately and gain a number of temporary hit points. So again, pretty cool subclass. Then we go to the timekeeper. So at level one, you actually get an expanded spell list. So you can pick up some spells that are all about, you know, messing with things, phantasmal, raise dead, dominate person. So some pretty good spell lists here. Curse of time. Whenever you damage an opponent with a spell, they become afflicted with curse of time. And then they take half your proficiency bonus rounded up, force damage at the start of their turn for the next minute. So for a minute, you're getting anywhere from one to two, right? Because it's half rounded up. So one or two potentially uh, damage every turn. So it's not a huge thing, but it'll work, right? Uh, time shift, starting at six, they're about to take damage. You can use your reaction to project your body forward, negate any damage and effects. You are considered banished until the start of your next turn. Um, you can only use this once between short rest or before long rest. So this is pretty cool. I mean, if you're about to take a massive shot of lightning bolt or something, you can actually go to almost like an ethereal plane and completely avoid the damage. So pretty nice ability to be able to use once every long rest. And then accelerate, you actually can turn your bonus action to briefly accelerate an alley. They gain haste until the start of the next turn and they don't suffer any penalties. So level 10, you can dish out a free haste and you can do this equal to a number of times your proficiency bonus per long rest. So when you get up to a level four proficiency, you can give out four free haste for a turn. That's pretty nice. So you give that to a, a paladin with a lot of smites or to a nice raging barbarian or to a fighter. I mean, it's a pretty great ability. Oh, we forgot one. And then finally, the one that comes with the Lost Valley DLC, you get more of a nature type version where you get an entangle, spike growth, etc. You get a piercing branch, so whenever an enemy hits you with a melee attack, they take an additional 1d4 piercing damage. This works really well with your Hellish Rebuke, rebuke ability. And then at level 6, you get uh, both your blood and your skin start changing color, so you can't be poisoned. Uh, you gain some resistances, the poison and necrotic. And at level 10, once per short rest, you can erupt and cause 1d4 per level of piercing damage. Push away and restrain all creatures. 1d4 per level of piercing damage. So if you're level 12 and you use this ability, you can do 12d4 piercing damage, push everything away, and they are all restrained. And this is per short rest. So as you can imagine, you can take an awful lot of short rests. So pretty much every combat, you could have this ability, which is pretty sick. 
All right, so now let's kind of talk about what you get as you level up as a Warlock. So a Warlock is very interesting because they only get a couple spell slots. Where they get a lot of their extra spells is from their, their evocations. And so as you can see at level two, you get to learn Eldritch Evocations. You actually get two. So this is where you can affect your, your, uh, some of your abilities. So one of the most important ones is you do Eldritch Blast. It is a very, very strong cantrip. It's probably the strongest cantrip in the game. And when you do it, you could actually use your Eldritch Invocations in order to have people get knocked back or to do additional damage, etc. Or you could pick things that are just innate spells, like, hey, I want to pick up the ability to cast Mage Armor for free. And then when you get to level three, this is where you picked your boon. Um, so you get to kind of have a pact. So you can be pact of the chain, pact of the to tome, and pact of the... What's the other one? Blade, I think. Um, so they all kind of do something special. Uh, Pack of the Blade's more melee-based. Pack of the Tome is more spell-based. And Pack of the Chain actually gives you some special abilities you can get from some, some different things, like an imp. or, And so it gives you special powers, which is pretty cool, since they don't have you summon imps and whatnot in this game. Uh, level 4, you get your ability score. Level 5, you get another Eldritch Invocation. Another one at 7. And then another one at 9. And so all these things are just additions to what you can do or your spells. And then level 11, you get to choose one spell, six level from the Warlock spell list, and you can cast it once without expending a spell slot. So this is really nice. You just get one free six level spell, and that's going to be very, very nice to be able to have it and not come for all your other spell slots because you don't have very many. And basically what it does is whatever spell level you are, anything you do, it just upcasts it, which is pretty cool. And then at level 12, you get another ability score increase and another Eldritch Invocation. So very interesting class, um, but a lot of fun because once you start buffing up your, your Eldritch Blast, you're just going to be Eldritch Blasting everything, and it's just going to be super, super fun. All right, so we covered the Warlock, the Monk, the Bard, and the Ancestry, so now let's kind of take a brief look at the new backgrounds that are coming with these. So we're just going to select one of these to get through here. All right, so the backgrounds that we get are the Aesthetic. So this one is very similar to some of the other backgrounds where it's it doesn't really have a lot of benefit. It's more for just being part of the, the theme, right? You choose an additional language, you get proficient with survival and insights, proficient with herbalism, and that's pretty much it. Then you get to the artist, one additional language, proficient with persuasion, deception, and performance, which obviously fits the bard, and a couple background items that you can sell for a couple gold. Other than that, very thematic. And then you get the occultist, and this is again another one additional language, proficient arcana and deception, proficient with scroll kits. So these are the three backgrounds that you get when you pick up uh, or that's just going to be available for free when this DLC is released. All right, so now we're going to have to go into another screen. So let's come back and I'll cover all of the feats that are now available. All right, so now let's look at all the new feats that came out with this DLC. Again, these are not paid. These are just part of the base game that came out with the DLC. So the first one up is Arcane, Arcane Appraiser. So this basically automatically identifies everything you put in your inventory. This is huge to have solely because the only things that have the identify spell are wizards and bards now. And so everything else you're going to either have to pick up certain items or pick up or pay for gold. So is it worth a feat? Maybe, but it's kind of a nice to have. Then you get to the Badlands Marauder. So this gives you resistance to poison, advantage on rolls against being poisoned, and a little additional con. You get the Burning Touch, so this basically allows you to punch something and add fire damage to it uh, once per every turn with unnatural, with unarmed attacks or weapons. So this is just an additional damage of a specific damage type that is going to be applied when you punch something or whatever. Uh, Cloak and Dagger, after you hit an enemy with a light weapon, you gain a plus 2 AC until the start of your next turn, which is nice. Then you get down into Daunting Push. When you successfully shove an enemy, they lose half their movement speed, rounded down. You get uh, Distracting Gambit. After you hit an enemy with one hand weapon, they lose negative one AC for one minute, and it doesn't stack. So it just basically allows you to lower the AC of something just on a basic attack. No big deal. 
Uh, we get electrifying touch, which is the same as your burning touch. It just now allows you to do electrify, and you can only do one of these. So if you learn one, you can't learn any of the other ones, so you got to be very picky. Uh, you get down here into four stalling strength. So while you're wielding a two-handed weapon, you gain additional AC. So this is great if you want to, you know, not pick up a, you know, you're not going to want to wear a shield. So you can pick up this and maybe some other subclass options where you can gain AC and still wield a two-hander. So I think this is nice for certain classes. Uh, Forest Runner, you gain plus two cell movement speed and one dex. So this fits a lot of classes that need a little bit more movement. Uh, you gain Icy Touch, which just gives you cold damage. You can also pick up the Melting Touch, which gives you acid damage. The Mender now, when you stabilize an ally with a medicine check, they gain, regain one hit point. So very similar to the the kit, the medicine kit that you get in the in regular 5th edition D&D. You can just pick them up off the ground with one hit point. I don't know why we would use this, but whatever. Mighty Blow, when you attack with a two-hand melee weapon, you deal additional damage equal to half your strength mod. So this is pretty nice. Uh, powerful Cantrip, I'm sorry, uh, ready or not, you have advantage on your attack rolls when you're using the ready action. Uh, you get Toxic Touch. This is the one with poison damage. Trip Attack. When you hit an enemy with a melee weapon ready attack, they must also make a contested roll as you use shove action to be knocked prone. So this and ready or not, I think are kind of used where you just wait for everything to come to you. I, I don't know. I mean, they have some benefits, but whatever. Uh, and I think that is all of them. I might have missed one. If I did, just put it in the comments below. I think Blessing of Elements was always in the game. Uh, and I think this was always in the game. So I'm pretty sure I covered them all. If I didn't, just put them in the uh, comments below. So that covers the main thing that came. The other thing is now you can use a gamepad. And then lastly, you have the ability to put boss monsters in your dungeons when you're doing the dungeon maker. Uh, I don't dabble with that very much, and I use a keyboard, so it doesn't affect me, but some of you might think that's really cool. So all in all, if you really want to play some of the best classes in 5th edition, pay the 10 bucks. The Warlock, the Bard, and the Monk are just super fun to have. Uh, the additional feats and the additional backgrounds are okay, but really the, the, the key here is playing some of those favorite classes from 5th edition, which are super nice. So I love this DLC. I can't wait to really dive in and see what the game has to offer with these new classes. And I hope you do too. So go ahead and make sure you stay tuned because I will give you full in-depth guides on the classes and what, what I would play, et cetera, et cetera. This is Van from the Vaniverse Gaming Channel. I thank you so much for watching. Cheers and peace out.